Bridge to Terabithia, Chapter 2, Leslie Burke. Ellie and Brenda weren't back by seven. Jess had finished all the picking and helped his mother can the beans. She never canned except when it was scalding hot anyhow, and all the boiling turned the kitchen into some kind of hellhole. Of course, her temper had been terrible, and she had screamed at Jess all afternoon and was now too tired to fix any supper. Jess made peanut butter sandwiches for the little girls and himself, and because the kitchen was still hot and almost nauseating full of bean smell, the three of them went outside to eat. The U-Haul was still out by the Perkins place. He couldn't see anybody moving outside, so he must have finished unloading. I hope they have a girl, six or seven, said Maybelle. I need somebody to play with. You got Joyce Ann. I hate Joyce Ann. She's nothing but a baby. Joyce Ann's lip went out. They both watched it tremble. Then her pudgy body shuddered and she let out a great cry. Who's teasing the baby? His mother yelled out the screen door. Jess sighed and poked the last of his sandwich into Joyce Ann's open mouth. Her eyes went wide and she clamped her jaws down on the unexpected gift. Now maybe he could get have some peace. He closed the screen door gently as he entered and slipped past his mother, who was rocking herself in the kitchen chair watching TV. In the room he shared with the little ones, he dug under his mattress and pulled out his pad and pencils. Then, stomach down on the bed, he began to draw. Jess drew the way some people drink whiskey. The piece would start at the top of his muddled brain and seep down through his tired and tensed up body. Lord, he loved to draw, animals mostly. Not regular animals like Miss Bessie or the chickens, but crazy animals with problems. For some reason, he liked to put his beasts into impossible fixes. This one was a hippopotamus, just leaving the edge of the cliff, turning over and over. You could tell by the curving lines. In the air toward the sea below where surprised fish were leaping goggle-eyed out of the water, there was a balloon over the hippopotamus, where his head should have been, but his bottom actually was. Oh, it was saying, I seem to have forgot my glasses. Jess began to smile. If he decided to show it to Maybelle, he would have to explain the joke. But once he did, she would laugh like a live audience on TV. He would like to show his drawings to his dad, but he didn't dare. When he was in first grade, he had told his dad that he wanted to be an artist when he grew up. He thought his dad would be pleased. He wasn't. What are they teaching in that damn school? He had asked. Bunch of old ladies turning my only son into some kind of a... He had stopped on the word, but Jess had gotten the message. It was one you didn't forget, even after four years. The devil of it was that none of his regular teachers ever liked his drawings. When they'd catch him scribbling, they'd screech about waste, wasted time, wasted paper, wasted ability, except Miss Edmonds, the music teacher. She was the only one he dared show anything to, and she'd only been at school one year and then only on Fridays. Miss Edmonds was one of his secrets. He was in love with her. Not the kind of silly stuff Ellie and Brenda giggled about on the telephone, this was too real and too deep to talk about, even to think about very much. Her long, swishy black hair and blue, blue eyes. She could play the guitar like a regular recording star, and she had this soft, floaty voice that made Jess squish inside. Lord, she was gorgeous, and she liked him, too. One day last winter, he had given her one of his pictures, just shoved it into her hand after class and run. The next Friday, she had asked him to stay a minute after class. She said he was unusually talented, and she hoped he wouldn't let anything discourage him, but would keep it up. That meant, Jess believed, that she thought he was the best. It was not the kind of best that counted either at school or at home, but it was a genuine kind of best. He kept the knowledge of it buried inside himself like a pirate treasure. He was rich, very rich, but no one could know about it for now except his fellow outlaw, Julia Edmonds. Sounds like some kind of hippie, Mother had said when Brenda, who had been in seventh grade last year, described Miss Edmonds to her. She probably was. Jess wouldn't argue that. But he saw her as a beautiful wild creature who had been caught for a moment in that dirty old cage of a schoolhouse, perhaps by mistake. But he hoped, he prayed, she'd never get loose and fly away. He managed to endure the whole boring week of school for that one half hour on Friday afternoons when they'd sit on the worn out rug on the floor of the teacher's room. There was no place else in the building for Miss Edmonds to spread out all of her stuff and sing songs like my beautiful balloon, this land is your land, free to be you and me, blowing in the wind. And because Mr. Turner, the principal insisted, God bless America. Miss Edmonds would play her guitar and let the kids take turns on the auto harp, the triangles, cymbals, tambourines, and bongo drum. Lord, could they ever make a racket. 
all the teachers hated Fridays, and a lot of the kids pretended too. But Jess knew what fakes they were, sniffing hippie and peacenik. Even though the Vietnam War was over and it was supposed to be okay again to like peace, the kids would make fun of Miss Emmons' lack of lipstick or the cut of her jeans. She was, of course, the only female teacher anyone had ever seen in Lark Creek Elementary wearing pants. In Washington and its fancy suburbs, even in Millsburg, that was okay, but Lark Creek was the backwash of fashion. It took them a long time to accept there that everyone could see by their TVs was okay everywhere else. So the students of Lark Creek Elementary sat at their desks all Friday, their hearts thumping with anticipation as they listened to the joyful pandemonium pouring out from the teacher's room, spent their allotted half hours with Miss Edmonds under the spell of her wild beauty and in the snare of her enthusiasm and then went out and pretended that they couldn't be suckered by some hippie in tight jeans with makeup all over her eyes, but none on her mouth. Jess just kept his mouth shut. It wouldn't help to try to defend Miss Edmonds against their unjust and hypocritical attacks. Besides, she was beyond such stupid behavior. It couldn't touch her, but whenever possible, he stole a few minutes on Friday just to stand close to her and hear her voice soft and smooth as suede, assuring him that he was a neat kid. We're alike, Jess would tell himself, me and Miss Edmonds, beautiful Julia. The syllables rolled through his head like a ripple of guitar chords. We don't belong in Lark Creek, Julia and me. You're the proverbial diamond in the rough, she'd said to him once, touching his nose lightly with the tip of her electrifying finger. But it was she who was the diamond, sparkling out of that muddy, grassless, dirty brick setting. Jesse! Jess shoved the pad and pencils under his mattress and lay down flat, his heart thumping against the quilt. His mother was at the door. You milk yet? He jumped off the bed, just going to. He dodged around her and out, grabbing the pail from beside the sink and the stool from beside the door before she could ask him what he had been up to. Lights were winking out from all three floors of the old Perkins place. It was nearly dark. Miss Bessie's bag was tight and she was fidgeting with discomfort. She should have been milked a couple of hours ago. He eased himself onto the stool and began to tug. The warm milk pinged into the pail. Down on the road, an occasional truck passed by with its dimmers on. His dad would be home soon. And so would those cagey girls who somehow managed to have all the fun and leave him and their mother with all the work. He wondered what they had bought with all their money. Lord, what he wouldn't give for a new pad of real art paper and a set of those marking pens color pouring out onto the page as fast as you could think it. Not like stubby school crayons you had to press down on till somebody bitched about your breaking them. A car was turning in. It was the Timmonses. The girls had beat dad home. Jess could hear their happy calls as the car door slammed. Mama would fix them supper and when he went in with the milk, he'd find them all laughing and chattering. Mama would even forget she was tired and mad. He was the only one who, could, who had to take that stuff. Sometimes he felt so lonely among all these females. Even the one rooster had died and they hadn't yet gotten another. With his father gone from sun up until well past dark, who was there to know how he felt? Weekends weren't any better. His dad from the wear and tear of the week and trying to catch up around the place that when he wasn't actually working, he was sleeping in front of the TV. Hey, Jesse. Maybell, that dumb kid wouldn't even let you think privately. What do you want now? He watched her shrink two sizes. I got something to tell you. He hung her head. She hung her head. You ought to be in bed, he said huffily, mad at himself for cutting her down. Ellie and Brenda come home, came, came home. Why couldn't he quit picking on her? But her news was too delicious to let him stop her sharing it. Ellie bought herself a see-through blouse and Mama's throwing a fit. Good, he thought. They didn't nothing to cheer about, he said. Burdy, 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 burdy. Daddy! Maybell screamed with delight and started running for the road. Jess watched his dad stop the truck, lean over to unlock the door so Maybell could climb in. He turned away. Darn lucky kid. She could run after him and grab him and kiss him. It made Jess ache inside to watch his dad grab the little ones to his shoulder or lean down and hug them. It seemed to him that he had been thought too big for that since the day he was born. When the pail was full, he gave Miss Bessie a pat to move her away. Putting the stool under his left arm, he carried the heavy pail carefully so none of the milk would flop out. Mighty late with the milking, aren't you, son? 
It was the only thing his father said directly to him all evening. The next morning, he almost didn't get up at the sound of the pickup. He could feel, even before he came fully awake, how tired he still was. But Maybelle was grinning at him, propped up on one elbow. Ain't you gonna run? She asked. No, he said, shoving the sheet away. I'm gonna fly. Because he was more tired than usual, he had to push himself harder. He pretended that Wayne Pettis was there, just ahead of him, and he had to keep up. His feet pounded the uneven ground, and he thrashed his arms harder and harder. He'd catch him. Watch out, Wayne Pettis, he said. Between his teeth, I'll get you. You can't beat me. If you're so afraid of the cow, the voice said, why don't you just climb the fence? He paused in midair like a stop-action TV shot and turned, almost losing his balance, to face the questioner, who was sitting on the fence nearest the old Perkins place, dangling bare brown legs. The person had jaggedy brown hair cut close to its face and wore one of those blue undershirt-like tops with faded jeans cut off above the knees. He couldn't honestly tell whether it was a girl or a boy. Hi, he or she said, jerking his or her head toward the Perkins place. We just moved in. Jess stood where he was, staring. The person slid off the fence and came toward him. I thought we might as well be friends, it said. There's no one else close by. Girl, he decided. Definitely a girl. But he couldn't have said why he was suddenly sure. She was about his height. Not quite, though, he was pleased to realize as she came nearer. My name's Leslie Burke. She even had one of those dumb names that go either way. But he was sure now that he was right. What's the matter? Huh? Is something the matter? Yeah, no. He pointed his thumb in the direction of his own house and then wiped his hair off of his forehead. Just errands. Too bad Mabel's girl came in the wrong size. Well, well, he nodded at her. See ya. He turned toward the house. No use trying to run any more this morning. Why did, might as well milk Miss Bessie and get that out of the way. Hey! Leslie was standing in the middle of the cow field, her head tilted and her hands on her hips. Where are you going? I got work to do. He called back over his shoulder. When he came out later with the pail and stool, she was gone.